on this Advent Sunday, the first Sunday of the Advent season. Advent, of course, from Adventus in the Latin, um, arrival or presence, from Perusia in the Greek, which means looking forward to, basically, and looking forward to the coming of Christ. Originally, just to his second coming. But, of course, it's been used as well in this season as we approach Christmas and we remember that when the time had fully come, Galatians 4.4, God sent forth his son. And this this morning, (laughs) this evening, we're going to uh, think just a little uh, of that familiar story, familiar to all of us, but maybe just dig in and the Lord will just pick out one or two points that maybe we haven't realised and to refresh us again. Now I'm going to ask Christine if she'd come up and give us this evening's readings, please. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfil what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The second reading is from Luke chapter 2, verse 8. The Shepherds and the Angels. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Christmas, of course, is a time that's familiar to all of us. Sadly, the meaning of Christmas isn't familiar to so many people in our country today or in our world today. And especially younger people. I guess virtually all of us would have been brought up in schools where we had Christian assemblies where religious instruction was based on the Bible, where morning assembly would have, would sing a hymn. We would have prayers, we'd have a reading, we'd have prayers, we would say the Lord's Prayer. My given name is Harold, although most people know me as Harry, and um, of course a few of my classmates always took great delight, well for a while anyway, When they said the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But whether they jested or not, they were familiar. They knew that there was a God who created this world. They knew that there was, that he sent his son. And that his son came into this world, lived and died, did good, taught, healed the sick, was crucified, raised again. And that Christianity, the church, was based on on the Bible, God's word. Sadly, that's no longer the case. But there is an opposite danger for those of us who are familiar with the scriptures and familiar with the Christmas story 
And that's that familiarity almost breeds contempt. We hear the readings, especially at Christmas, and they don't excite us. We don't really think what's there. We don't meditate them, on them and realise just the marvel that's being given, that we're being told that what God actually did. We read in Matthew 1 that the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. We realise his mother and her, we would say fiancé today, they would only have been teenagers from a poor place and nobody's humanly. But we find that Joseph was told that she was, when she, no, she was going to be pregnant or that she was pregnant, he was horrified because they were good. They were God-fearing. They had not come together sexually. So his first thought would be that Mary must have been unfaithful. But while he was considering these things, we're told, as we read, he was a good man. He was wondering what to do. No doubt he prayed about the situation, prayed for wisdom. And we find that the angel appeared to him. The angel of the Lord came to him in a dream and said and told him, don't be afraid. Carry on as you were going to. Take Mary as your wife, because this conception is of the Holy Spirit. And he's going to bear, she's going to bear his son. And you shall call his name Jesus. That means God saves or God will save. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place, as we read, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. The whole of the Old Testament is about Jesus. He said that himself on the Emmaus Road in Luke 24. Remember that couple of disciples no doubt part of the wider group of disciples that Jesus had, those who would follow him around, be familiar with his teaching. They were despondent. On the resurrection morning, they didn't know that Christ had been raised from the dead. They were on their way to Emmaus, seven miles or so from Jerusalem. I'm sure they plodded with their heads down. And you find Jesus, drew a, Jesus himself drew aside, uh, alongside them. But he didn't reveal himself. We're told their eyes were beholden. They didn't recognise him. Amazing though that may sound. But it was only afterwards when they arrived. They said, didn't our hearts burn within us? As he, and what had he done? He'd revealed, he told them, that must be the greatest sermon ever preached. He said in all the scriptures, the, the things in the Old Testament about himself. The Old Testament was God's gradual unfolding, God's gradual revelation of his plan, of the coming of the Messiah. The people in the Old Testament, the, the, God's people in the Old Testament, knew that blood sacrifice was needed. They were given the sacrificial offering system and so on, which could never take away sins, but pointed forward to the Lord Jesus that he was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the other um, servant songs in Isaiah, that he was going to suffer and die, but he was also God's king. He was going to come and reign, and he was going to be the answer to the problem of sin. Man's rebellion against God, against his laws, basically against the principles of his word. And so his name, Jesus it was not just any name. It was a familiar name at the time. The Old Testament equivalent was Joshua. So it wasn't as if it was a name that wouldn't be familiar to people. But the meaning here had much more meaning in the person of the Lord Jesus. And notice, not he will come and attempt to save people. He will save his people from their sins. And this is what the Lord Jesus came to do. He was God's answer to the problem, not God's afterthought. God didn't have to kind of readjust and think, well, I've called the people, called the Hebrews, called the Jews, called Israel, and they've rebelled against me, as they did so often, of course. And he punished them. Exile of the ten northern kingdoms, 
uh, not exile, but annihilation by the Assyrians. Exile of the two southern kingdoms, Judah, the southern king of Judah, uh, and Benjamin under Nebuchadnezzar. But God's answer unfolded, and it was his eternal purpose and his eternal plan. I quoted Galatians 4, 4. When the time had fully come, when God's time came, he sent forth his son. He sent forth his son, promised in the Old Testament, but only as a shadow, revealed in the New Testament. And he came for a set purpose. He knew this. All the way through his life, he talked about having come, being sent by his father, sent for a purpose, sent to save people. But not just to save his people from the penalty of their sin. It's not popular today, it's not fashionable, politically correct, to talk about sin. It's not talk fashionably correct to talk about a God who is holy, and a God who, because he is holy, cannot look on sin, and has to deal with and punish sin, and banish sinners from his sight. But why else would he have sent his son to suffer and die as he did? I, I, I love the Easter hymn, really, um, Green Hill. There was no other good enough to pay the price of son. He, sin, he only, Jesus Christ only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. God had to come in the flesh. We're familiar with what's usually the ninth reading in our carol services. Next Sunday afternoon, I'm leading a carol service in a little URC church. Well, United Methodist in URC, just about three miles or so from home in a village called Wheatonstead. And they, they want to do it as lessons and carols. And obviously, I'll put in um, comments and a, and a mini epilogue at the, at the end on that. But... The ninth one is usually the, um, the beginning of John chapter, John's Gospel, John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And you drop down a little bit further. The Word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. I hope that never ceases to amaze us. I hope that never brings us out, our hearts out in gratitude and praise and worship and thankfulness that he, by whom and through whom the world was made, he who was very God, don't try and understand the Trinity, or I prefer the expression tri-unity. How can God be three and one? One God, but Father, Son and Spirit. Our feeble minds, human mortal minds, are not capable of understanding deity of understanding the infinite God but God's word teaches it and we believe it by faith and we realize that that was God who was there in that manger that was God who came into this world he was perfectly God the, the um, scripture Isaiah seven fourteen was fulfilled there behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And just in case there's any doubt about the meaning, we're given that in scripture, which means God with us. That baby was God. 100% God. But that baby was 100% man. Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew's written to a Jewish audience you could say that Matthew is the gospel of Jesus the King. And therefore Matthew starts with Abraham. Remember it was Abraham who God called. Abraham, Abraham was just a pagan like the others. There was nothing special about Abraham. But God called Abraham. Chose him, equipped him, told him that he was going to make him the father of a great nation. The people of God. And that he would be blessed and would be a blessing to all nations. And the Lord Jesus makes it absolutely clear, and Paul does in several of his epistles, that true believers are Israel, the true sons of Abraham. In John 8, Jesus said to, to the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, 
He said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? They recognised and they trusted in, they believed in the Lord Jesus. And so here we have the fulfilment. God, 100% God, yet 100% man. 100% man so that he could identify with us. He could be our representative. We often think how, you think of David and Goliath. And you've got the Philistines, and you've got on the one hand, and you've got Israel on the other. They had a choice. Either the whole armies massacred each other, great bloodshed, or they picked a representative. And that representative represented for the, the whole nation. If he won in battle, then the nation had won the victory. If he lost, then the nation had lost. That's a principle there for us, that the Lord Jesus Christ is a representative of his people. If we trust him, then his victory over sin, his victory over death, his victory over Satan, his victory over and his banishing of the penalty of hell, the penalty of sin, was gone in him. And so here we have the Lord Jesus who did this. But also he was human, as well as being God, and he had to be God. He had to be sinless to be able to bear the sins of his people. I'm just going to quote from a, a short bit from um, J.C. Ryle here, who can say this, the 19th century Anglican, godly Anglican bishop. We shall often find, as we read the Gospels, our saviour could be weary, go hungry and thirsty, staying out his real humanity. He was a genuine man, just like any human being here. And he says... He could be hungry, weary, thirsty, could weep and groan and feel pain like one of ourselves. In all this, we see the man, Christ Jesus. We see the nature he took on him when he was born of the Virgin Mary. But when we also find in the same Gospels that our Saviour knew men's hearts and thoughts, that he had power over devils, that he could work the mightiest of miracles with a word, that he was ministered to by angels, that he allowed a disciple to call him my God, and that he said before Abraham was, I am, and I and my father are one. In all this we see the eternal God. We see him who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. If we'd have a strong foundation for our faith and hope, we must keep constantly in view our Saviour's divinity. He in whose blood we are invited to trust is the almighty God. All power is his in heaven and earth. None can pluck us out of his hand. If we are true believers in Jesus... Our heart need not be troubled or afraid. If we would have sweet comfort in suffering and trial, we must keep constantly in view our Saviour's humanity. He is the man Christ Jesus who lay on the bosom of the Virgin Mary as a little infant and knows the heart of a man. He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He himself experienced Satan's temptations. He's endured hunger. He's shed tears. He's felt pain. We must trust, may trust him unreservedly with our sorrows. He will not despise us. We may pour out our hearts behind, before him in prayer boldly and keep nothing back. He can sympathise. Let these thoughts sink down into our minds. Yes, it was necessary that that baby should be 100% a normal baby in his humanity, but also 100% God so that he could bear away our sin. In Luke, we have something that's absolutely fascinating, and I think we can often miss. Apart from, or immediately apart from Joseph and Mary, the first people who saw the infant Christ Jesus were outcasts. They were shepherds. Shepherds were lowly folk. I wonder if you've passed over so often. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping over their watch by um, um, their flocks by <clears throat> night. But those shepherds were abiding in the, in, the, in the fields. I think, if I remember correctly, the, um, the um, NIV says, were living there, or were dwelling there. We could say they dwelt. Their job was out 
in the fields. The shepherds were the lowest of the low. They weren't allowed, like tax collectors, they weren't allowed into the temple. But they would be looking after sheep, lambs, that were being prepared for the sacrifices in Jerusalem, just a few miles up the road. And it's to these folk that the angels appeared with that glorious message. That glorious message of hope. Hope for the world. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting, isn't it? The Lord Jesus himself called himself the good shepherd. Remember going back in the Old Testament, Moses, who was brought up from infancy in the palace. He, would, he had authority, he had power, he had privilege as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Yet at the age of 40, he knew the call of God. He knew that those were, the Egyptians weren't his people. And he ended up in, I love the old King James, it sound, it's very graphic. He was banished, in a sense, to the backside of the desert. He went from the highest place to the lowest place, the place of, uh, 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 where you'd be despised. And for 40 years, he looked after sheep. We think of David. The Lord Jesus was the son of David, great David's greater son. David was Israel's greatest king. A man said God himself, after my own heart. And David could say that God had raised him from the sheepfold. Stuck out there. Remember when Samuel was told by God to go to Jesse and to anoint one of his sons as king. That Jesse had seven strapping lads. And he paraded them there. He didn't even bother to call David the eighth son in. He was just out there. He was the, the least. He was only fit for looking after the sheep. But ah, remember what was said. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. That should encourage us, shouldn't it? That should encourage us big, big time. Because how many of us, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I love that, where Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, he says, consider your calling. Think who you are. I mean, how many of us are household names in society? How many of us are regularly on television? How many of us in Hello Magazine or all the rest? How many of us are seen as, uh, uh, as celebrities and lauded and praised and given every, all the privileges in this world and so on? And people speak your name almost with reverence. None. Or if you are, let me know afterwards. Apologies. But I doubt, I doubt that's the case. But what does, what, what, does, what does Paul say? For consider your calling, brothers. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And I love verse 30. And because of him, it's God's doing, his grace, his love, his mercy. His calling us, causing us to hear the gospel, not just with these ears, but to hear them in our hearts and to recognise that gospel is the message I need. That's the saviour I need. Because God, by his spirit, has convicted us of our sin and of our being under his wrath and his righteous judgment. God chose what's low and despised in the, the world, even that, so that things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, or the one who glories, glory in the Lord. I love these shepherds. I love the story. Yeah, they quaked with fear. Every time a single angel appeared, people were struck with absolute fear. Here we find that they ended up with a, he they had an he a heavenly choir. They weren't expecting this. That night on that lowly hillside, suddenly 
the host of heaven there, proclaiming a message, proclaiming good news, proclaiming the best news. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I'm not surprised. But the angel said, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. Notice, not a Saviour who was the Lord, and he ceased to be the Lord, now he's just a man, he's just a baby. But that baby in Bethlehem there was the Lord. He was still the sovereign Lord of all. And he is Christ a couple of weeks ago, I, we, I preached on Peter's great confession in Matthew 16, where Jesus said, who do you say that I am? I, the Son of Man, am. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter said, you're blessed. Because you've not got that from reading. You've not got that from humanity. That's come because my Father's revealed that to you. And here, God, through the angels, revealed to these lowly shepherds, these outcasts of society, that there's a saviour, and that saviour is Christ the Lord. He's the Christ, he's God's anointed prophet, God's anointed priest, God's anointed king. But these lowly shepherds, they were the first to get that news. And they were told there's a sign, you'll find him. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then there's a great host of the, with that angel. And the heavenly host were praising God. What a choir that would be. We think of great choirs who sing magnificent oratorios like Handel's Messiah. But they couldn't compare with this. The angels, do you realise the angels continually around the throne of God sing praise and worship. There's an old hymn, I don't know if anybody knows it. There's a verse of it, I don't know the first line, but the verse is, holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. And one day I shall make the, help them make the vaults of heaven ring. But when we sing salvation story, they must fold their wings. For angels never knew the joy that our salvation brings. The angels, obedient servants, these were the good angels who hadn't rebelled. They obeyed every command of God. They obeyed his will implicitly. They brought the news of a saviour. They must have marvelled that how could God be so gracious that he would send his son into this sin sent world to be abandoned, to be rejected, to be despised, to be tortured, to be rejected. Such grace, such love, such mercy. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace with God. That's the greatest need of humanity today. Yes, we pray for, yes, we say peace in the world, peace between man. But even if there were no wars on this earth, that is not sufficient. That's only for time. We need to have peace with God. We need to be reconciled with God. And that reconciliation is through his son, through that baby who came, who grew up, who came to reveal the Father who opened up the way into his presence, the way to heaven, through his cross. That's why the cross, and so many of our churches have a symbol, an empty cross. It reminds us of the price. When we take communion, when we break bread, that reminds us of the great cost. His body broken, his blood shed for us. But notice what the, the, the shepherds did. You could almost say the, the shepherds dwelt. They would have booths or little tent things and they would be living out all weathers, all night. They would live out on the hillside in the sheepfold with their sheep. You could say they dwelt there. You could say that when they heard the message, they believed the message. They felt. They felt it in their minds. They felt it in their emotions. And they felt it in their wills. Because 
they say the angels went. The angels disappeared into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Do you think it's amazing? These lowly people, I believe, were amongst those who were looking forward to and waiting for the consolation of Jerusalem, for the revelation of the Messiah, God's son. No, no doubt Joseph and Mary were. You have Zechariah and, uh, and Elizabeth who were. We find out after the birth of Jesus, you have Anna, you have Simeon who were. God had his people, even in amongst the, the, the apostasy of his people in the Old Testament, who believed the word and were looking and waiting for. They believed, they accepted it, they felt it, they realized this is good news for us. They left the sheep and they went. We're told they made haste. They didn't dither about it. They didn't have a debate and say, well, did we have too much to drink the night before? Was this just a hallucination? Were we just imagining all this? Is this just a, an amazing dream? They believed the word that they were told. And they said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing, which the Lord has revealed to us. That's significant, isn't it? They didn't just say that these angels have revealed to us. They said the Lord, the Lord God Almighty has revealed to us. You see the revelation, God's spirit working in these people. So they came with haste. They found Mary, Joseph, and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen as it had been told them. It wasn't just that they dwelt as outcasts, that lowly job looking after the sheep. It wasn't just that they felt and felt, this is great, this is the best news we've had, let's go and act on it. I remember a Scotsman saying a long time ago that the gospel, the good news of Christ, is better felt than uh, told. But they told, they told it. I've got to try and make it right. They told the good news. They couldn't, you see, when you come face to face with who the Lord Jesus is, when you realise this is the good news, you don't want to keep it to yourself. You want to share it with people, with family, with work colleagues, with neighbours, with friends. They couldn't wait. And you see the reaction. They were glorifying, they were praising God. And they, the people heard. The people were filled with wonder. Amazing. These shepherds, this is an amazing story. They told them the good news. They became early witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that's what we're called to be? As believers, Jesus said, you are my witnesses. He doesn't send angels today now to tell people the good news of why Christ came. The good news of salvation. Their need as sinners and that need being met in the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses you and me. This Christmas, do you want to be used? Do you want the Lord to use you? Do you pray, Lord, use me? I'm only whatever. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm nothing special of myself. But as Paul says, through Christ, I can do all things. May this Christmas, this, this not just be a story, not just be a season, but be a time when we ask the Lord, Give us opportunities, opportunities to spread the good news in a society that desperately needs it. A society where people really, if you get them, question them, really are without hope. Jesus Christ. The first Sunday of Advent, this Sunday, if we were doing the, some churches have the candles. And the first Sunday today, it's hope. That hope is the glorious hope in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a second advent. He's returning. This world is not going to continue as it is. It is not going to continue in rebellion, in getting more sinful and, more, uh, and worse. That's Lord Jesus who returned to heaven is coming back. And he's going to wrap up time and space. And he's going to judge the living and the dead. Those who have recognised and trusted his son Will be, reckon, will, be, will be brought into heaven, eternal bliss with him. Those who have rejected, 
will be banished from the presence of the Lord. Those who have rejected Christ now, he'll give them what they wanted. They wanted nothing to do with him now. They'll have nothing to do with them then. And that is the, that is the warning of the gospel. The Lord Jesus gave more warnings than anybody else. It's not surprising he spoke more about hell than anybody else. He knew. But he warned to flee it. He warned not to, basically not to end there. And because he's coming back and he's going to usher in his new kingdom and there'll be no more pain and no more suffering and no more war and no more hardship and no more crime and no more sickness and all the things that are the fruit of sin and rebellion in this world. Do you look forward to that day? We can do. Our final hymn picks that up. Lo, he comes with clouds descending, once for favoured sinners slain. Thousand, thousand saints attending, swell the triumph of his train. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God appears on earth to reign. And then we sing in our last verse, and I trust we sing this in our hearts. Yea, amen, let all adore thee, high on thy eternal throne. Saviour, take the power and glory, claim the kingdom of thine own. Hallelujah, everlasting God. Come down.